Congratulations, you made it to question number three of the Summa Theologia. I'm Dave Palmer, and uh, thank you. We, we call this the gist because what you're getting in these videos is just the basics, the gist of the questions of the Summa Theologia. We're not going really deep, but I want to give you an opportunity to see how the Summa Theologia flows from one question to the next, because St. Thomas Aquinas made it very, very clear that there was a very logical sequence in the Summa Theologia. It wasn't just these random questions just kind of popping up here and there. It all makes sense, okay? And I've taught the Summa Theologia to high school students for about 10 or 11 years now, and this particular question is one one of the more challenging questions and uh, to, to explain, and interestingly, it's called the simplicity of God. The other thing that's interesting to point out is that we are now, okay, the, the, the first question was about sacred doctrine, right? And we, Thomas showed that our end is supernatural and we need help to get there and we need to, to, to learn about it because otherwise we wouldn't know where we're going. And uh, the second question was the proof for the existence of God, and is, he, is it self-evident, is it demonstrable, right? So now, questions 3 through 11 are what are called the attributes of God. There are seven attributes of God that we're going to cover in questions 3 through 11. And if you're really, really smart, you're saying, wait, wait a second, seven attributes, nine questions, 3 to 11? It's interesting why there are nine questions and seven attributes, but I don't want to get ahead of myself, but just stay tuned because that will all start to make sense as to why seven attributes are explained in nine questions. Okay, I promise it's going to get there, right? So we typically think of God as being complicated, right? You know, uh, you know, we seem like we're simpler than God because God has to run a universe and answer all these prayers and all that. Well, it's just the opposite. God is perfectly simple, and I think there's a reason why uh, the, the the very first uh, attribute that St. Thomas Aquinas gives for uh, God is his simplicity. All right, so this is going to be kind of complicated. We're going to go through it kind of quickly. I don't want to take too much time, but I want you to get the gist of what St. Thomas Aquinas is getting at with the simplicity of God. All right, so let's get to it. And the first article is whether God is a body. Now, notice he didn't say whether God has a body, all right? There have been philosophers in the history of philosophy that have tried to claim that the divinity has some kind of material aspect. Well, we, as Christians, we don't believe that God, that God has any material aspect. Even when he assumed human nature, God did not have um, a body. God assumed a body. Jesus Christ had a body, right? But God doesn't have a body. In fact, um, well, okay, yeah, let's just <laughs> leave it at that. So why can't God you know, be a body, right? Well, the, the first, I guess, most important reason is that bodies can move. Bodies can be acted upon, okay? Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas is very clear, as we learned last question, that St. Thomas, that, that, that God is the first mover. He moves all things. He is unmoved himself, so all bodies move, and so therefore he can't have a body. All right, uh, number two, whether God is composed of matter and form. Okay, so this dog, for example, has matter and form. The matter is, you know, the, 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 what Aristotle would say, the material cause, the things that it's made of, like the fur and the blood and the bones and the sinew and muscle and all that. And uh, the form is dogness. It's what it is, right? So, But the two are kind of dependent upon each other, and they come together to form a composite. And they, the, the two of them merge, in a sense, to, to form a composite. And, and, and that can't happen with God. God doesn't have parts. He doesn't have things that come together to make him because he is altogether simple and that wouldn't be consistent with God. All right. Now, these next two questions, so articles, uh, are, are really interesting. And I, I find, you know, when I was reading through the Summa the first time, uh, this just absolutely fascinated me. And it's, it's kind of boggling. It's perplexing. But, you know, just kind of take it and absorb it and pray over it and see if it makes sense to you. Whether God is the same as his essence or nature, okay? Our nature is human nature. This bird's nature is bird nature, which means that it shares a nature with, you know, billions of other birds in, in, in the world, right? It, but it has that nature. But this particular bird is not bird nature. It just has bird nature, right? But since there's only one God, as we'll learn, God is the same as his nature. He's the same as his essence, all right? God is, and that has to do with 
his simplicity is that he doesn't have parts he doesn't have he doesn't have a nature he just is divine nature and there's only uh one of him okay so hopefully that helped all right number four uh whether the essence and existence in god are the same thing all right so um let me read this here real quickly uh if the existence of a thing differs from its essence the existence must be caused either by some exterior agent or by its essential principles and so now you see how it, it ties in where we, we learned last question that God is the uncaused cause. Okay, nothing causes God, right? He, he causes effects, but he doesn't cause anything. He has no potentiality to change. He is pure act without potentiality. And so when, when you have an essence of, like, let's say, bird essence, and then all of a sudden you got a bird, a bird exists, right? Well, something had to bring that existence into existence, and that means it, 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 there was something that acted upon it. So with God, his essence and his existence, what he is and that he is or that he exists is the exact same thing. All right. And just think about that and how amazing that is. You know, you are a human. You have human nature. I have human nature. But you're not human nature. Right. I'm not human nature. I have human nature. So do you. But we are not human nature. All right. Is God contained in a genus? You know, Aristotle was actually one of the first ones or like the first one to classify all the animals. And they have all these scientific names and they're all categorized. Right. But uh, that that shows that they they have you know genus and species and familia well well god is not like that you can't put him in a box and classify him as something because as we just learned god is existence god isn't part of existence he's not a thing within existence he is existence himself whereas this toad you know, is contained in a genus because he participates in existence and he is in existence itself. All right. Are there any accidents in God? Okay. The accidents of this cricket would be its size and its color and its shape and, you know, things like that that are not essential to what it is. Well, God is his essence. God is essential. And so he doesn't have anything that can be uh, let that are like is unnecessary. You know, like the fact that I have brown here is not necessary to my essence. Okay. That's just an accident. The fact that I'm five, eight and weigh a hundred and well, <laughs> more than I should, let's just say that that's, that's not essential to me. Those are accidental qualities of me, but God doesn't have any accidents. Okay. So finally, and this is kind of funny that, you know, he goes over all these different parts of, you know, what it means for God to be simple. And then in article seven, he's kind of like doubling down, you know, is God altogether simple? Well, yeah, you just, you, know, you just explained it over six articles. And so for some reason, Thomas feel, feels like he needs to kind of pound it in one more time. You know, there's, there's neither a composition of quantitative of parts in God. Every composite is posterior to its component parts. Um, every composite has a cause. Every composite has potentiality uh, and actuality. And so none of these things apply to God, right? Finally, the last um, article in this one, and this is really interesting because if you study the, the, the history of philosophy, which I have done pretty extensively and really enjoy doing it, a lot of philosophy and, of course, theology has to do with the interaction between God and the created world, okay? Like a guy like Hegel really was very interesting in what he said about these things. And so now that we've established that God is perfectly simple and he doesn't have a body and he's his own essence and, and existence and so now Tom is saying, well, then does he enter into the uh, composition of other things? Is he like in them? And I guess the basic, he's, and the answer is no, okay? he, he doesn't. But I think the, the way that I can explain this the best is to say that, uh, that, that, that things have their own essence, okay? So like I have the essence of humanity or humanness, right? And this pen has the essence of penness. Well, God is not in this because then you're starting to flirt with pantheism. Because if God was in this pen, if God was in me in the sense of my essence, well, then I'm God, right? But then again, we're also going to learn that we have a spark of divinity in us. And so it, it, it's, it's a fine line. And as we go through the Summa, you're going to see 
it's really, really interesting as St. Thomas Aquinas talks about the relationship between human beings, you and me, and God, because because we are made to the image and likeness of God, but we are not God, okay? So we are not pantheists. We don't think we're God, but we participate in the divinity, which is really interesting and will be explained as we move through the Summa Theologia. Thanks so much for watching. God bless you.